Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. It is very exciting to be, as we mentioned, the book is coming out today. It's my first major work in English language. I, I used to work in Finnish, in Finland. So it was a bit of an ordeal, but we've come to this place, and it was also an exciting journey for me, and I hope that um, you people will find it interesting as well. I know that, obviously, many of you have either Nordic uh, background or you come from Nordic countries, so I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts yourself, so hopefully we'll discuss after I uh, talk. So I'm planning to just sort of talk about a little bit about my background, thinking, uh, some of the main ideas in the book. Obviously, I can't go into all details. The book has a, a lot of discussion on different policies, different countries, and so on. Now, first of all, I wanted to start with simply explaining how I got to be in America. So as mentioned, I came here in 2008. Before I lived in Finland, I was quite happy living in Finland. I didn't have any plans to move abroad. Um, I was working as a journalist. I had lived in Finland all my life. I had had exchange student years abroad and so on. I had visited the United States and New York. But um, eventually, what happened was I met an American man, <laughs> the most old reason. Um, and we dated long distance for a couple of years. Tried to figure out what we're we going to do. He lived in the United States. I lived in Finland. And so obvious question was, I could move to America, he could move to Finland. This was not an easy decision, and we really thought about it hard and for a long time, but eventually it seemed that it makes more sense for me to come to the US. First of all, of course, I speak English already, Trevor didn't speak uh, Finnish, we're both journalists, so we worked uh, in, with our language, and so it would be harder for him to do that in Finland. Of course, I was also excited. I mean, who doesn't want to come to the US, especially in New York? Um, it's the land of freedom, the most powerful country in the world, American dream is what we're all looking for. So I thought this is going to be actually great. It's a new experience, it's fantastic, a, a new part of my life. And so I came to America, and to my surprise, what I discovered was a little bit of this. <laughs> First of all, I thought, it's just me. I came here, all of a sudden I started to feel really anxious about all kinds of stuff. I just felt like I, I, I'm not in control of my life and I'm not making things happen. And at first I also thought that, well, it, it is just me. Because as I'm sure many of you know, Americans often think of Nordic countries as these sort of socialist nanny states where citizens are being pampered, they're dependent on the state, they don't really take responsibility for themselves, they don't take risks. And this is what I was kind of thinking, that it seems like Americans are right. I'm not, I'm not handling this America thing well. I must be one of those pampered Nordic citizens. So I thought, okay, I just have to suck it out, a little bit of Finnish fizzle. It's gonna happen, um, grit. But after a while, I realized that it wasn't just me. Everybody around me seemed to be very anxious as well. I'm sure all of you know that, that one of the biggest discussions in America is how stressful life is and how anxious everyone is, how families struggle. And so I was sort of, wondering what's going on. There's this American dream, this country that has always led the world. Middle, American middle class has always been the wealthiest, most opportunity for everyone. Everybody wants to come to America. But when I came here, all of a sudden, it didn't seem like everybody's as happy as you might expect. So around this time, a lot of other kinds of news started coming out. And maybe many of you have seen these too. There were all kinds of surveys, studies, comparisons of countries. And Nordic countries always did really well. They come, came up on top. One of the most um, perhaps noticed ones was this Newsweek cover. Maybe you remember it. It was in 2010. Newsweek had looked at all these things that I mentioned here. Uh, they had various uh, calculations and whole big investigation into what is the best country in the world for you today? And particularly, the exact question was, if you were born today, which country would provide you the very best opportunity to live a healthy, safe, reasonably prosperous, mobile life? And the winner was Finland. So here I was in America, I had just left Finland behind, <laughs> <laughs> wondering if this was smart. Um, but other people were wondering too. So the Finnish reaction was basically this. <laughs> I'm sure many of you Perhaps no Finnish people, no Finnish mentality. Finns are not known for their great self-esteem. Finns are also not known as being the most cheerful or happiest people on earth, which made this all the more baffling, especially to Finns. 
that supposedly were so great. I think most Finns were thinking this is ridiculous, this is not true. I was kind of thinking of this myself. Um, in fact, a Finnish tabloid went as far as to take a look at the Newsweek study, try to replicate the results, and claim that it was wrong. Switzerland was the best country, Finland was second. <laughs> I think Nordic, like Swedes and Danes, basically, when they saw all those studies, they were probably like, yeah, that sounds about right, our country's great, <laughs> but not Finland. American reaction was also a little bit like this. And I think there's reasonable doubt. <laughs> what do these small, homogenous, socialist countries have to teach the United States. Like they might be great, sure, they might have a good quality of life, but obviously they are very different from the US. Why are we even talking about them? Fair enough. Except for, for example, this guy. <laughs> Lately, as I'm sure you all know, um, Bernie Sanders has brought up Nordic countries as an example. I think Bernie and Hillary both are bringing up many ideas that are in place in Nordic countries. As an example of something that the U.S. could do, Bernie's supporters, of course, also are very uh, much seeing that maybe there is something we can learn. For me, the problem with Bernie really is that he talks about socialism. I do not think for one moment that Nordic countries are socialist by any definition, and I'm going to talk about that here now. I think many things that he suggests make sense, but um, socialist, no. To say what I'm overall thinking, um, the main idea of my book is that we live in the 21st century in a globalized world. People work more and more in, in different kinds of uh, less stable work relationships. They, they are Uber drivers or self-employed. They're entrepreneurs. They change companies. What makes sense for us today? How, how are we going to build our society in a way that serves the best quality of life for all? And to start, I would like to say the Nordic countries, they're free market capitalist countries that have instituted smart social policies that really serve people well. This is not socialism. And that's the main lens that I'm looking uh, at these countries and this. And this is, I think, the biggest myth that Americans have that I would really like to be able to perhaps change or examine. Uh, in the book, I, ha I discuss many questions today. I'm mainly going to focus on three things, family, education, and healthcare. In the book, in addition, I look at business innovation and government, but um, too much to get into everything now. But I know that maybe many of you are still sitting there and thinking, yeah, but it's not going to work in America. Nothing's going to work in America. <laughs> America is actually, to me, it has been interesting to see how pessimistic Americans can be about instituting any kind of social policies. Otherwise, anything can be done. We can go to the moon, we can do anything, but this cannot be done. Uh, so I just want to briefly address a few questions that often get asked and maybe many of you are thinking on before I start discussing the policies. People often, America obviously is big, much bigger than any individual Nordic country. However, many of the things that I'm talking about in terms of family, education, healthcare, they are handled by the states in the United States. And there are 30 states with smaller populations than Finland. So if you'd want to do something similar, it's possible at least size of population is not stopping you. Diversity is one thing that Americans always say. I think this is also based on one misconception that I'm going to talk about. But um, Americans often come to me and they say that, well, Nordic countries are so homogenous. Um, they all love each other. They want a big family, they want to help out, that works in America, it's diverse, nobody wants to help out the other person who looks different from me or who has different religion. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but first I just want to show that I think often Americans partly have a call it, uh, old view of what Nordic countries are like. Those of you who know Nordic countries well, Sweden is incredibly um, diverse today. More foreign born residents than in the US. Um, Finland less so, getting more diverse for sure, but um, even so, again, America has 19 states that have less foreign born residents than in Finland. I know that diversity doesn't just mean recent immigration, but still there are many states that are not very diverse that could do plenty if they wanted to. So partly I think many of these um, concerns, they're real, but they're also slightly excuses to just stop the conversation and think it's not going to happen. First of all, I'm going to talk about family. 
So let me tell you something that is not common in Finland or in any Nordic country, but that is very common in the United States. A breast milk refrigerator. I had never heard of such a thing before I came here. <laughs> as soon as I came, I started hearing these, hearing these stories, American women telling me how they get up in the morning, they pump milk, they leave that at home, they go to work, they pump during the workday, they rush to get back home so that they can get this milk to the baby. To me, this doesn't make a lot of sense. I think Nordic countries have moved beyond this kind of stuff where it's almost impossible to have children and have a successful career at the same time. I mean, we live in the 21st century. It should not be this hard, as I'm sure many of you know that it is. And in the United States, parents are often forced to either go back to work immediately, very small children go to daycare or have nannies, maybe you can't um, breastfeed even if you wanted to, or one of you is forced to drop out. Usually it's the woman, sometimes it's the man. When you look at any surveys of American youth, now college kids, this is not what they want. This is not what most people in today's world want. They all say, both men and women, that they would like to have a career and take care of their children and share work equally at home and at work. But then you look at what happens once they go to the workplace, they can't do it. It's not in America, it just doesn't happen. Nordic countries have done a fairly different um, system and in Nordic countries all of them provide at least nine months of paid parental leave for every employee. It's not dependent on your employer. It's not dependent on the size of the employer. Everybody has this right. They have also um, instituted what I call in the book daddy only days which means that part of the parental leave that is paid from a common social insurance fund. It's not paid only by the employer of that person who stays home, which I think is a very important distinction because it's obviously very unfair to expect that employers would just bear the cost on their own. And it means that women's employers are gonna be affected more than, than men's usually because women are more likely to stay home. But so Nordic countries have actively tried to um, encourage men to stay at home by making some of these payments that come from the public funds available only to men, and the family loses it if men don't take it. I know it happens, it sounds crazy, it's like nope, never. Americans don't want to pay other people's parental leave. I'll get to a, a more of, a, of that logic later as well. But it seems to me that a lot of people actually do today want to, and it is possible both Hillary and Bernie um, have, have plans of doing this. And the one great reason for doing this that is not un-American, that is in fact very American, is that this helps people to work. I often hear Americans also tell me that, sure, it's great, you can give all these policies to everyone, like benefits, they can get paid while they're not working, because in Nordic countries people work, and in America they don't work. Well, this is a little bit crazy, I, I think we all know that Americans work a lot, but it is based on statistics that show that out of the working age population in Nordic countries, more people work than in the United States. Part of the reason is that they can. All these policies, affordable daycare, which in Nordic countries is subsidized by the government, um, paid parental leave that allow parents to stay home and then have their job waiting for them when they come back. All of these help people to work. These are not just policies that, that help people not work. It's the other way around. Just to cap, these are the kind of things that I would talk about that, that help parents, make them more peaceful, help everyone's um, well-being, make life more, more sane for everyone. And I know that you also maybe think that, well, sure, but happiness and family life, it's about other things too. It's just not about paid parental leave. I don't know if many of you saw, but there was a recent study just a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, the New York Times wrote about it, about a happiness gap. In the United States, parents are less happy than people who don't have kids. Now that's fairly sad, I would say. And in other countries, like Nordic countries, it's the other way around. People without children are less happy than people with um, children. And what the researchers came to was that there's three reasons for this. Affordable daycare, paid vacation, and paid sick days. These were actually the factors that affected people's happiness most and this happiness gap. 
So if we're in pursuit of happiness, maybe we can start here. The next part that I wanted to talk about is education. Maybe many of you know more about this because this has been discussed a lot, especially because Finland has done very well in international education service. So I'm just going to be fairly brief with this. In America, we're all sort of waiting for Superman, stuck. As I'm sure you all know, America, education is one of the most conspicuous sources of anxiety for Americans. This was a surprise to me as well when I came. In Finland, not so much. Sure, somewhat, but not at all uh, the same way as it is in the US. People are worried about whether the public school is good, whether they can afford private school, whether they can pay for daycare. And there's a reform movement that for several years now has been trying to fix things very hard, which is of course great. People are paying attention, trying to fix things. But what I discovered was that the US is actually doing exactly the opposite what Finland has done. Americans are basically trying to achieve quality through competition, choice, control in the form of standardized testing. Now people are realizing that maybe that's not going to work. Um, but education doesn't really work that way. And we're seeing just today, maybe some of you read, there was an article about Detroit, where in Michigan, there's the biggest movement of charter schools in the country, and they have really opened it for everyone. And the results are horrifying and dismal, and parents are really in trouble. Social services are so essential and so difficult to solve through regular competition that it just makes more sense to do what most other countries in the world do is just focus on public education. The US, of course, has public education and has been leading the world in public education. But today, the focus is so much more on providing all these different kinds of uh, private options. So why am I even talking about Finland? Uh, this is basically just to show you quickly the reason. Um, this here is Finland. PISA is an OECD study surveying 15-year-olds in different countries in reading, math, and science, done every three years. And Finland has done very well. Um, the US is here, the purple line here is the US, so not so great. What has been the most amazing thing about Finland is that almost all students do well, and there's very little differences between schools. Finns are worried. It seems like in income inequalities, uh, inequalities are growing in Finland too, but compared to America, it's still very small. So what has Finland done then? Basically, when Finland started um, reforming its education in the 1970s, it made the choice to focus on equality instead of excellence. Finns were talking about how can we give good education to every child in this country. And so how can we? The policies they instituted, number one was teacher education. Teach, it's, all teachers in Finland have to have a master's degree. The programs are rigorous. In the United States today, I'm sure many of you know, teachers in various states, there's all these different programs. The, many of teachers as well feel that when they come out of the education school, they're not prepared. So this would be certainly one step where America could um, step up its game. Finland has focused on public schools. There's almost no private schools in Finland, which to Americans is often shocking. But if it shows anything, it certainly shows but that focusing on public education can produce great results. We could argue that maybe focusing on private education produces great results as well, but we haven't seen that yet in the US. And I'm not sure if we're going to. Uh, some of the basic policies that Finland has done are very easy to replicate elsewhere. All students get recess several times a day. All students get school lunches, free school lunches in school. This is the idea that a school is a place where children uh, taken in as human beings, taken care of as a whole. They have to study for sure, but just staring at the books or doing tests is not what it's about. It's also about taking care of a, the child as a whole. And so what we can learn from Finland really is that it's possible to create excellence through focusing on equality. And I think it's really a choice. In the US often people also say that, well, American schools are so diverse, what can you expect? It's true, it's a challenge, absolutely. But if you look at actually the results in, for example, these OECD studies, American immigrants, uh, first, first generation or second generation, don't do worse than like, Americans who have been in the country longer. So it's not so much that we have so many immigrants who don't know the language. I mean, it's a challenge for sure for some schools, 
but overall it's just that the quality, the funding, the way it's organized is not working. The third area is healthcare. Now this is of course incredibly complicated, big, I discuss it in length in, in, in the book, uh, what are the focusing on choice or focusing on um, wait times or this or that, it's very difficult. However, all other wealthy industrial nations have decided that the best way to offer healthcare is through some form of universal healthcare. It doesn't have to be the same model, there's different models, but it makes sense because again, just like education is such an essential social service, and people who need healthcare or need education, they're not in a position to say no. It's not like buying jeans, like, oh, I don't like this. The price is not right, I'm gonna walk away. So there's always this problem with the balance between the buyer and the seller. For me, this was American healthcare. I wasn't sick yet when I arrived, when I started working on getting health insurance, so I didn't have to worry about that part. But the amazing thing for me was that I also had to worry about actually having health insurance, which was a problem because I was a freelancer. My husband was a freelancer. Uh, eventually he got a job just so we can basically get health insurance. But the whole, I don't have to tell you guys this, the whole health insurance um, system where you have to, every time you change jobs, you change maybe health insurance, plans change, doctors don't take your insurance, you have to figure out if you're lucky, you might have amazing health insurance and get the best doctor, good for you. But for a lot of Americans, it's not working that way. And here is something that Americans do. They pay more than anybody else in the world. This is America. By wide margin, Americans are spending more on education, uh, healthcare, sorry. So you can see that uh, Sweden is also spending quite a lot here. Denmark, Finland, I think not enough actually. I think Finland should be spending more, uh, Iceland. Now, you could say that, well, that's okay because Americans get the best healthcare. So if you get the best quality, sure, you're gonna pay more. Is that, is that true? I look at that uh, in the book. It's very hard to compare quality of healthcare. But there are a lot of studies, obviously, that have been done that look at survival rates from cancer, how long people live after their diagnosis, uh, how long people live with diabetes. And in fact, Nordic countries and America have very similar rates even better in some cases in Nordic countries. So Americans basically get great care in many cases, but so do people in other developed countries. And Americans just have to pay more for it and often have to go through more struggles to just arrange it to figure out their insurance and stuff. The photo that I have here is a Finnish neurosurgeon that I went to interview and, and follow at work. And he's one example of high quality healthcare. There are many, but um, in Finland in particular, uh, here he is, the other people around him are actually international surgeons who have come to Finland to observe him work. So what do Nordic countries do? They provide healthcare as a, a universal service that is paid through taxes, just like America pays, uh, doctors are paid salaries, like uh, public school teachers in the US or firemen or police. This is not the only way to do it. Americans, of course, often talk about public auction, which would be sort of the Canadian model that you have a public insurance that pays for private companies. There's many ways of doing it. But what I really want to say is that universal healthcare can set you free. And this is something that I think Americans often doubt. Americans think that you're going to be in prison, some bureaucrat is going to decide your care, you can't choose where you're going to go, choices are going to be made for you. My point is that in today's world, 21st century, globalized economy, where a lot of people don't have steady jobs that last for 20 years, it makes sense to separate healthcare from your employment. Not that you don't have to work and pay taxes or pay insurance payments or whatever, but it shouldn't be tied to the employer. Partly, it's terrible for employers. I'm not surprised that American businesses are not so excited about this. It's very expensive. The costs are rising all the time. It seems very socialist to me to have businesses have to take care of something that has nothing to do with their business. I think this is perfectly the job of government. It also frees individuals. You can become an entrepreneur, you can become self-employed, you can change jobs in a way that makes sense for you without thinking that your whole family might lose health insurance if you do that. 
and we can discuss more about this later, but my experience and all the studies that I've looked at really show that this kind of um, healthcare can actually give you more freedom. Which brings me to this philosophical question. What is freedom? I've thought about this a lot. I guess a lot of people think about that. And my take on this is that in 21st century, where we are now, it just makes sense to arrange a society where certain services are provided as a public service, and after that, the government can lead you to it. Now, I'm not saying that Nordic countries always do this. There's a lot of discussion in Finland constantly how you have to pull back on regulations or this or that to give people more freedom. But basic idea of providing basic social services that create, give everybody freedom to um, employ themselves in any way they can without jeopardizing their whole families, their children's futures, that gives you freedom. So one of the main themes that I discuss in the book is related to freedom. I call it the Nordic theory of love, and it's related to independence. Uh, this is something that I observed when I came here, but I really put it into <laughs> words and thinking when I discovered these two Swedish um, academics. One of them had lived in the U.S. for 10 years, uh, taught at Barnes College. Oh, sorry, he had lived here 30 years or more and studied here, but he uh, taught at Barnard, Barnard um, here in New York for 10 years. He has now moved back to Sweden. But so they wrote a book in which they talked about the Swedish theory of love. And when I heard of this, I said, oh, this is exactly what I'm thinking constantly in America. So the idea is that in Nordic thinking, authentic love and friendship are really only possible between individuals who are independent and equal. And they really have to be also financially independent. Now, we all love family. Nordics love their family. It's not about not loving your family. It's about coming to the family unit as people who have your independence in check. And this means that in Nordic countries, the ideal family is made up of adults who both work, both take care of children, and children who are encouraged to be independent as soon as possible. This, in fact, creates stronger, happier families. I know Americans sometimes doubt this. If you look at any studies, a lot of um, indicators show that Nordic families are um, just in general in better health. But just think about the happiness gap that I just mentioned. I mean, Nordics are generally happier if they have children than if they don't. Americans are the opposite. So I think in America, people are in many ways actually imprisoned by these dependencies that come from the fact that even though economy has moved on, world has moved on, America's social services are still stuck in a place where family is the unit that provides. So the husband provides if the wife is uh, on parental leave. Parents provide health insurance even for children who are already 21 years or older. Um, families, parents pay huge amounts for college tuition. So in many ways, children's faith is really tied to their family's abilities, which really in the past was the opposite of the American dream. But today, that is what happens. And I think the Nordic theory of love in many ways is actually American thinking in terms of being able to stand on your own two feet. And it's not about government giving you handouts. It's about universal level playing field. Everybody gets this. After that, you should work on your own and, and figure out how to arrange your life. The next thing I want to mention is also related to freedom and the previous point. Americans also think it's charity. From Nordic point of view, it's self-interest. Middle class pays for services that middle class uses. It's not that some people don't work and they get all these benefits. These are services for me. And I think this is an important point when we discuss the diversity question. I do not want to underestimate the effects of racism in the world. It is true that people make a lot of decisions because they're prejudiced or they're racist, they even work against their own interests, that's a real question. But I think in Nordic thinking, this is not a question of, oh, do I want to help out this person next to me? It's about, does this work for me? Does it provide freedom for me and my family? And overall, Nordics think it does. Now with immigration, it's a big problem of all of a sudden, there's a huge amount of refugees coming in at once, 
Many of them are maybe not educated at the level that would help them work. I mean, this is, of course, a challenge. But it's not a question of, oh, we can't do this because we don't like how those people look. People who oppose immigration in Nordic countries are not saying that, oh, let's get rid of all these services. They want those services. The problem then might be that they might not want to share with people who come in recently. And, and this is something that is problematic. But I don't think it means that in America you couldn't have anything because of diversity. Finally, I think all these policies serve the most American of all values, equality of opportunity. This is a British labor politician who said this some years ago in our conference on social mobility. And what he was talking about was children's ability to rise above their parents' income or education level. And this is the American dream, right? We all want that our children will do better than we did. If you look at any studies today, in the US, children uh, of poor families are much less likely to start making more than their parents, than are children of poor families in Nordic countries. So you can sort of quantify it if it's not enough to see the amount of stress and anxiety that people have over these questions, that in Nordic countries, the American dream and opportunity is more uh, present today. And I do not think that it's just because of their culture. I think it's very specific policies. I think American reaction might still be a little bit like, hmm, I don't know, maybe it sounds good, but not going to happen here. Just to repeat some of these points, <laughs> in case you have doubt, <laughs> I've been asked often. But I also want to discuss uh, government, because that's another question that Americans often feel like, well, American government is not working. It's, it's just not going to happen. There are so many things happening right now in the US. And it's kind of funny that I come from the outside. I've lived here now eight years, and I'm an American citizen, and I often feel like I'm more positive <laughs> than, than many Americans who already live here. But so you can see that parental leaves, New York, California, New Jersey, Rhode Island have already instituted systems where paid parental leaves are provided through an insurance fund that employers, uh, employees pay into. The Family Act is a law in Congress uh, suggestion that we could create a national system that would similarly work through Social Security and people would pay into it and then they would get paid parental leave. There are so many cities and states that already have increased minimum wages, have instituted uh, directives, regulations about paid sick days. There's many things that federal government does very well in America. Medicare, Social Security, people are generally very happy. Daycare in New York City just started pre-K, public pre-K for all four-year-olds and that program was put up very quickly. I mean, I think it's actually an amazing accomplishment that it seems to work as well as it does. It was just seemed like Lil de Blasio came in and instituted it, and a year later, it's working. So just finally, now I'm getting to the end. Oh, right, Bernie also. <laughs> I just would want to say that I do not like the socialism part, but I think Bernie's just success shows that many people want this. And I'm not sure why we should think that, oh, people want this, but it's never going to happen. If half of Americans want this, if more will want this when they discuss it a little bit more, when they read my book, <laughs> maybe it can happen. But just to cap this off, I think also the American debate that is between socialism or freedom is just faulty. I mean, it's not a choice between these two. Nordic countries are free market, capitalist countries that just have some smart policies that work. It does not have to be an anti-American thing or a socialist thing, and it does not have to be something that takes away your freedom. In fact, I think smart policies give you more freedom. Thank you. This is about what I have thought and come to, and the book has more, uh, all kinds of thoughts, but we could discuss now, and if you have questions or comments, we can have that and then we can continue later too in the lobby. <laughs>